You're listening to That's Pretty Dark. The podcast where we talk about all of the entertainment that scared us as children. And still haunts us as adults. So grab your flashlight and join us as we take a frightfully nostalgic look over our shoulders. And under our beds. And in our closets. And together we'll realize, whoa, that's pretty that's dark. Pretty dark. <laughs> So Absalom, you were right. I was right. You were Guys, correct. we looked it up and uh, my biblical programming goes way down deep because I remembered the name of the, I believe he was a king. Now I'm getting it all. <laughs> now you're second guessing He was a brother yourself. of a king. I don't know. But his name was Absalom. That's the point. And I knew that and it came out of literal mm-hmm. thin air. So yeah, what we're talking about is from our last episode, the Green Ribbon Part 1, <laughs> where we were discussing right. beheadings and decapitations. Absalom rode on a mule. The mule went under the thick bows of a great terebinth tree Whoa. and his head caught in the terebinth. So he was left hanging. Wow. Was that like a cautionary tale against men having long hair? Probably. God. Maybe he wasn't beheaded. Well, it at least killed him. It at least scalped him for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. His head got caught and he died. And the mule which was under him went on. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Good for you, mule. You know what? You're better off without that guy. Honestly. I was kind of right. I was kind of wrong, but that's okay. Look, that's what we're here for. Look, we're not worried about whether you're right or wrong because this is That's Pretty Dark <laughs> Podcast and my name is Christian. And I'm Kaylin. And we're so pumped. We sure are. We've got some more death and disturbing things to talk to you about. And more talk about men's hair length coming up in a little while. Oh. Also women's. Hard hitting stuff. The hair length of people in general. So I was even more on topic with Absalom than I thought. This is part two of The Green Ribbon, and we're talking about beheadings having to do with the Alvin Short story called The Green Ribbon. That's right. Where we left off last time was we found ourselves in the midst of the Reign of Terror in Paris during the French Revolution, Mm -hmm. where lots of people were just losing their heads, Mm -hmm. you know? Off with their heads. Now, this is pretty much everything that happened as a result. Yeah, hit me. You ready to talk about some victims' balls? (laughs) I wasn't prepared for that, but sure. There's a little something called Le Bal de Victime. Mm -hmm. This is a supposed urban legend suggesting that there was a secret society of social elites who happened to be close relatives of victims of the guillotine during the revolution. Hmm. Many sources say that these were youths because... Who else would have such a rash and morbid fascination with the horror of the guillotine and the mass executions within the French Revolution than young people? No, yeah, it's all our fault. The idea is that you would have to be aristocracy to be invited, but also closely related to a victim. Right. And as you said, a lot of the victims of guillotine were upper Mm -hmm. class. These parties were seen as macabre and decadent. Not only cathartic after the loss of a loved one, but also celebratory in the wake of the end of the reign of terror, Hmm. meaning the return of their family estates and therefore their family fortunes. So there would be a dress code for these soirees, which were known as costume a la victime. And this came from uh, people who were led up to the guillotine. Okay. You know, they had been in prison for who knows how long, Mm -hmm. not treated very well, dressed in rags or loose fitting clothing or whatever they had on hand. These people at these soirees would wear short haircuts or hairstyles that exposed the back of the neck. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, they would wear a red ribbon or a red string tied around their neck. Oh, yes. Or in a like cross back pattern over their shoulder blades which was in mockery of the sort of like X marks the spot, huh. indicating the X on the back of a person's neck when they were going to be guillotined Yikes. to ensure a clean cut of the neck. Is that where the phrase X marks the spot comes from? I couldn't find that for certain. Okay. I know that in relation to like treasure maps. Sure. I mean, same here. I think most people would. There but could very well have That been. sounds like a weird like thing that could have trickled down. I think that's possible. I can't say for certain. I read a lot of things that said X marks the spot in regard to this. So it, it could very well be that that's where it came from. Huh. Maybe just decapitations in general, like beheadings in general, maybe. Yeah. The short haircuts were worn in solidarity of these victims and were referred to as coiffeur à la Titus or coiffeur à la victime, meaning hairstyle of Titus or hairstyle of the victim. Mm -hmm. So these hairstyles 
were short in the back and long in the front across the forehead. Mm -hmm. And apparently this style became very popular in France at the time. Yeah. Titus here refers to the historical figure Titus Junius Brutus, who was featured in the play Brutus by the French Enlightenment author Voltaire. Mm -hmm. And this is mainly because that play in particular had a revival during the French Revolution. Mm. Here are some really interesting historical connections between Voltaire, this play, and these revolutions of the era. Okay. I mean, art imitates life, imitates art, imitates life. That's exactly truly what we see time and time again. I hear you say that in my head all the time. Do you really? Mm -hmm. It's true. I hear you say art imitates life, <laughs> life imitates art all the time. I really appreciate I that why. that's my voice that you hear. It's just you, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. Kaylin's right. She's right. Mm -hmm. I could get used to that. So in 1730, from the stage, for the first time, Voltaire's play Brutus is put on. Mm -hmm. The actor playing the character Brutus yells, Gods, give us death rather than slavery. Give me liberty or give me death. Boom. In 1775. As tensions rise between the American colonies yes. and Great Britain, oh, yes. Patrick Henry utters, Give me liberty or give me death. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In 1778, a mere three years later, maybe less, France assists the American colonies in its revolution yes. against Great Britain. Lafayette. Which nearly bankrupted the French economy, mm -hmm. which is one of the many factors leading to the French, the French Revolution. revolution. In 1787. Yes. So uh, three years from that, on November 17th, 1790, during the revolution, there's a revival of Voltaire's play and on its opening performance at mm -hmm. Comédie Française in Paris, the actor playing Brutus yells, gods, give us death rather than slavery, mm -hmm. leading to absolute pandemonium in the audience. <laughs> oh my God. It's amazing. I love how it's like France, America, France because of America, back to France, and now France. Yeah. It's all connected. We had a lot in common back in those days. and It all connects. It all connects. These victims' balls were believed to be bits of fiction created by the romance authors of the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. There was supposedly a legitimate victims' ball held at the Hotel Telusson in support of family members who had lost loved ones to the guillotine. Wow. So that may have been like one that existed. The victim's ball. And then everything else beyond that was just, you know, fantasy and urban legend. Maybe that one didn't even exist. Wow. We don't really know. Or they did happen all the time. Whenever I die and like my wake is happening, call it the victim's ball. <laughs> a ball the victim? Yes. Because I was a victim of life, regardless of how I go. <laughs> and life, it'll kill you. Every time. Every time. So whether or not these soirees actually happened, or if there was just the one at the hotel or whatever, there were apparently still many people who did wear their hair short, as well as some women who did wear red ribbons around their necks or red shawls as a fashion accessory mm -hmm. to represent solidarity. It became a symbol of the revolution. It became a symbol, exactly. Just as much as the guillotine is a symbol of death, wearing the red ribbon was almost weirdly a sign of life. A it's choice. defiance. It's defiance? Yeah, yeah. I, I like it. Me too. Some even say that because the short haircuts at that time became so fashionable for men, that that's why uh, it's so common for the modern Western man to have a short mm -hmm. uh, hairstyle. Good grief. Why it's so foreign for a modern man to have long hair like yeah. I have right now. That is pretty crazy. With my hair pulled up to expose my neck. Yeah, you sure. You have you got a bun going on. I have to do it. I have to do it. I'm in solidarity. <laughs> this is solidarity. I was in solidarity for a long time. My hair covers my neck now, but for a couple of years there, it didn't. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. I'll just get a red scarf. It'll be fine. There's weirdly like some evidence to suggest that like this had a greater impact on the female aesthetic at the time mm -hmm. because it was said that by 1802, nearly two thirds of the women of fashion in Paris had the tightest haircut. Wow. Which I think is pretty dope. Yeah. I mean, fashion has a lot of ties to world issues. It's Some of it feels left field, but the idea of tracing something back to when it became fashionable, mm -hmm. super interesting because the origins are always surprising. Oh, definitely. And that leads us to our fashion history podcast that we have <laughs> coming out in January. I'm the least qualified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm barely qualified to be here, but oh, certainly Lord. not qualified to be there. One thing I found really, really like uh, visceral. So when you're going, when you're at one of these uh, dance parties, these soirees, and you're going to ask someone to dance from across the room, mm -hmm. you might bow mm -hmm. or you might nod your head in their direction. Apparently at these victims' balls, they would make eye contact and there'd be like a swift 
Oh my God. Drop of a head, <laughs> right? Yeah. You demonstrated. You didn't see it, but I did. <laughs> a very jerky, swift it's not head a nod. motion. Yeah, it's a drop in your head. Downward. Oh, that's so. As wow. though your head was falling off. Mm-hmm. Your head was being divorced from the body. And that was the signal. That was the signal. Wow. And then there were other articles I read that said that the actual dancing involved a lot of jerky. Oh, head, head motions as though your head was loose. Do you know what? Do you, you know what I'm thinking of right now? You have to hmm. read my mind. You can do it. In what context? Jerky dance movements at a ball. What am I thinking of? I'm just picturing peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> no. At a ball? Uh, yeah. Jerky head motions at a ball? Uh, the Boo to You Parade. Mm, Magic Kingdom. Yeah. Mickey's Not So Scary. Haunted Mansion. So. The for anyone that's unfamiliar, apparently I'm gonna work Disney into every episode. I've only seen this one time. Okay, well I'll send you I'll send you a video. But okay. they have the grave diggers, and they also have these ballroom dancers, like paired couples, men and men and women. They're all in like rags and tattered, uh, ghostly clothing that's like mm-hmm. shimmering and very like ethereal, and are dancing very swiftly and smoothly in some moments, and then in in certain other moments in the music, it gets very jerky and like like unsettling. Yeah. And the women, at one point in the song, just all cock their heads to the side and scream in unison. Yes! I remember yeah. that now. Yes! Oh! Yeah. That Sorry, has to that's come just where my this. mind goes. It probably does, like, just... Because this is nothing new. This this concept has been around since the earliest version of this uh, woman wearing a like, ribbon. You, you think ballroom dancing, you think beheading, right? I mean... <laughs> I mean, I do now, for sure. <laughs> oh, I will forever. <laughs> They're saying in the, now. you know, 25 to 50 years after the French Revolution, that that's when these urban legends began to be invented. This, this yeah. concept of these victims' balls because of all the beheadings. So, like, yeah, it's been around for, like, 200 years, guys. Like, it's Mm -hmm. old, old concept. And clearly permeates culture in ways that we don't, like, give it credit for. This is one of those things. This is like a virus. This is what collective trauma does, guys. Yeah, this is like a poison that sort of, like, just sort of lived just beneath the surface, influencing so many aspects of our culture that we don't even... Totally. We we don't even really fully understand yet. And it's perfect for That's Pretty Dark, because literally this is what collective trauma does to society. Hmm. Mm-hmm. This is what happens. Mm-hmm. And that's where we are. We're 20 years removed from the 80s, 90s that, you know, traumatized some of us and this collective trauma in media yeah. and how has it affected our generation. I mean, it's the same same concept. Right. And, and what's trendy and what's fashionable and what's popular. And all of this shows up and inspires a little, a couple little scary ghost stories for children back in the 80s, the 70s and the 80s. Mm-hmm. Crazy. God, isn't that weird? Isn't that crazy? I love it. This is why I love sociology and anthropology. So the public's increasing fascination with beheadings and the how the term victim or victims, like how that became synonymous with those who had lost their heads during the revolution and the sudden excitement over these clandestine macabre parties where people mm-hmm. pretended to have had their heads chopped off and then stitched back on again. Mm-hmm. It's really no wonder at all that whispers of weeping ghost women wandering the streets of Paris wearing these bits of fabric to cover the wounds on their necks. Mm -hmm. It's really no surprise, no wonder that this happened, to bubble to the surface of the collective French consciousness. Now, arguably, one of the most disturbing details of uh, certain versions of this story is that the woman's head is commonly still able to speak Mm -hmm. after it has fallen off. So this begs the question, Are we to assume that this act of the head falling off kills her? And if not, how long are we to assume she stays alive afterward? I couldn't tell you. In the green ribbon, Jenny is already dying, so we know she isn't immortal. But the head is already unattached from the body, so it's falling off can't kill her, right? Mm -hmm. Like, has she been dead this whole time, or is she dead now? Right. Who's to say? So naturally, this got me wondering about the real-life implications of having your head cut from your body. I mean, I I feel like I've wondered. I feel like I've looked it up a couple times. Like, Mm. you know, you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. There are some animals that Mm -hmm. your your corpse continues to animate and and do things. Oh, and there's one story of a chicken that after its head had been cut off, it lived for months and months and months. (gasps) Oh, I hate that. It has a name. I think it's like Henry. Oh, Henry. Oh, Henry. God. I forget. All right. Tell me about the people. I'm, okay. <laughs> I got to stop thinking about Henry. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Let's talk about the people. 
there is a surprising amount of information about this online. Mm-hmm. Uh, so honestly, you know, go pour yourself about four fingers of whiskey <laughs> or maybe open a bottle of wine like I've done this evening and spend a night just indulging your own morbid curiosity. <laughs> Oh, this is where I have to be responsible and give a trigger warning. I was about to say, does that count as your trigger warning? Okay, good. This is a, this is a trigger warning because, you know, uh, I'm about to get into what happens if your head is removed. So just be aware that's happening. Mm-hmm. So before diving into these details, let me give you a quick breakdown of the possibilities. <laughs> Either the sudden drop in pressure and loss of blood would cause you to slip into a coma instantly, mm-hmm. or you'd remain conscious for roughly four seconds before slipping into a coma, mm-hmm. or you would remain conscious and entirely aware of your surroundings for up to 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. But no matter how long you do remain conscious, there is modern evidence to suggest that your brain might very well stay active, sending you into a state of dreaming until you perish, Whoa. which could last anywhere from a few minutes to half an hour. Oh my god. We can only hope that this is absolutely pure bliss, but the truth is we have no idea. Mm. And Dr. Vink wants all these electric brains. Oh, mm-hmm. Luckily for us and our, our morbid curiosities, there were a few quote-unquote scientific experiments during the French Revolution in regard to how long the head remained conscious after divorcing the body. Thanks to the French Enlightenment period, which had a hell of a lot to do with the French Revolution to begin with, Mm -hmm. there was much debate at that time about where the capital S self existed. Mm -hmm. In other words, the consciousness, the soul, right? Yes. Does it dwell in the body or in the head? We don't know. Mm -hmm. Either way, (laughs) people began to argue that the guillotine was still an imperfect death because it didn't mean that death was instantaneous. See, they were hoping right. it was humanitarian. The instant nature of it was what made it more painless, clean, humane, quote unquote. Exactly. But people yeah. began to go, um, is that real? No, I don't, I don't think so. Mm. They knew that a person stopped moving, but that didn't mean they were dead. Yikes. So they began to see if they could find out how long a head would remain alive after being removed from the body, if it died at all. Which sounds crazy now, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't back then. Right. This is because they didn't know what death was or what it meant. There's never been a clear line between life and death. No. (laughs) So, like, let's get one thing straight here today, guys, and that's pretty dark. We still don't know Mm -mm. what death is. Nope. We have no idea. Have you ever heard of a death doula? A doula? You you know what a doula is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a a death doula, I mean, I'm, you know, I... Certainly not an expert on the concept, but apparently there is such a thing as like a death doula. Mm -hmm. I'm sure hospice, you know, nurses, caretakers are trained in some of these things, but they know the process because there's a whole process. If you die by natural causes, I should say, there's a whole process that your body goes through when you die. And there are things that they expect. And then there are often things that happen that they can't explain. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Still, there Mm -hmm. is no explanation as to why these processes occur or what exactly is going on. Mm -hmm. I read an article recently that I believe that she called herself a death doula, but she was talking about how there's oftentimes this like um, rally that will happen like the day or two before the person dies where they've been kind of comatose and very Mm -hmm. going downhill essentially. And then they'll have a day where they're speaking, they're, you know, alert, they're eating, whatever, for like a day. And then the next day they're gone. Yeah. Um, And they don't know why that happens, apparently. It's wild. I don't know. Not to interrupt you, but they're... No. It's all that to say, genuinely, like, we just know so little. Yeah. Well, that's like Dr. Sleep. He sort of is a death doula right. when he gets, t- yes. takes that oh, job yeah. at the Absolutely. old folks home. Yep. He sits with people because yep. he can f- he can sense the afterlife, so he helps them mm-hmm. pass. Good example. I'm going to research that now because yeah, now you've piqued my interest for sure. Definitely interesting. So if you're at home thinking that you understand death, think again. <laughs> if you think you have any of the answers, you're not asking the right questions, my friend. Mm. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's true. You might be asking yourself... Why didn't they perform these mad scientist experiments before the French Revolution? Well, they did, only there just weren't that many beheadings. Again, they were reserved mostly for people of noble birth, so there aren't that many of those people. That's like the 1%, right? Or less. Mm -hmm. To have an actual experiment, to understand something, you need like a control. You need consistency. You need a lot of it to happen. Right. This one story I read about a beheading in Prague a long time ago said that the head of a young man was placed back onto his body after it had it had been removed. Mm. And it was said that it briefly showed signs of life. Mm. 
The reason why these scientific experiments, if you want to call them that, were able to be pursued more voraciously during the French Revolution is because of the sheer number of people losing their heads on a regular basis. Yeah. So they were able to try things out. Well, that didn't work before. We'll try it again in, you know, three hours when we have our next beheading. Oh, science was so crude for so many millennia. Yes. It's just very difficult to fathom. So one of the most famous stories from this time period involves the beheading of a young woman named Charlotte Corday. I feel like her name is familiar, but I have no idea why. I first heard her name years ago, thanks to the Me Without You lyric. Ah. I saw Charlotte Corday with a knife in her hand. Mm -hmm. She was 24 years old when she was executed for the assassination of the French revolutionary Jean-Paul Marais. Wow. Her severed head was then held up to the crowd Mm -hmm. and slapped across the face, (gasps) after which her cheeks blushed and her expression momentarily turned to anger. Oh my God. Before the life faded from it. Oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) I got chills. Yeah, that's a lot. That is more than pretty dark. Like... We've, mm-hmm. we've, ta- we've, we've ca- taken a whole other path here. We've crossed the line. Yeah. And I apologize to anybody. I, I gave you a fair yeah, warning. sorry. Told you. Trigger warning. <sighs> there were plenty more experiments during this time, many of which were very cruel. The only way they could think to get a reaction out of these people who had been beheaded was to expose them to various types of pain. Sure. Mm-hmm. In attempts to get, you know, reactions. Uh, such as exposing the head to, like, the flame of a candle. Mm. Other tactics involved just shouting at the heads. Can you imagine, like, actually doing that? Like, being the person that did that? If they were executing you, you deserved to die in their eyes. Right. Right? So for them to hold your head up, that was a victory. Mm, still. You were the villain. Yeah, people thought about corpses and death and bodies differently than we do today. It was bloodlust at its best. Or worst, mm. I guess we should say. Worst. So yeah, I, I I had the same thought. I've been I've been around this in circles mm-hmm. and circles in the past like week because I'm thinking, man, how tough would that be? And then I go, oh, but they wanted to do they've it. They already cut your head off. Yeah, I struggled with exposing flame to the head, lighting a candle for the purpose of burning the skin. Yeah, to see if they react. I thought that was cruel, and I was like, well, they just cut this person's head off, so. No, honestly, that's a step down. Yeah. And it's so, when you get into this, like, okay, there's death. There's no life versus death. This is death. Well, it's they were desensitized. They were desensitized. Like you've mentioned before, you know, public executions, like everyone was so desensitized to Mm. that concept. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mm. it's weird. People used to understand death and pain in ways that we cannot fathom today. Yep, that's right. We are not As capable. little as any of us have ever understood, people were comfortable with it in societies that we simply wouldn't be in aren't. I mean, it should have never been this common. Like, let's say that too. Yeah. It should never have been that common, but it was. Ethically speaking. Ethically. Yeah, it's it's just, just really difficult to, to hear. I think one of the most famous legends from this time period, and it's the one I heard about in college or something a long time ago. I don't know if we were studying world history and I studied the French Revolution or whatever. I don't know where, but I've known this story for a long time. There was this incredibly prominent French chemist named Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier. And again, another Antoine. I mean, common French names, I guess, too. I mean, I guess Antoine's pretty <laughs> pretty common, but still. I agree, though. Parallels. He was executed alongside many other financiers during the French Revolution, during the Reign of Terror. Just death and taxes, am I right? <laughs> oh. He agreed, as his last service to science, to blink every second for as long as he was able to after his head had been cut off. Okay. And depending on who was telling this story, it said he blinked about 30 times. Okay. So that has stuck with me, that your head might remain conscious up to 30 seconds after it's been removed. And the fact that he could focus on, I need to blink and like make that happen. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Yep. I mean, we we went into a little bit of this with uh, the Phantom Cab and Dr. Vink and like the mystical, magical, like mm. silly side of it. And I feel like now we're seeing the other end, you know, where we talked about seances and knowing things but beyond where you go. Like I wondered if we would get to a point where somebody instructed someone being beheaded to mm. cooperate in some way. Yeah. And then my my mind immediately is like, you're being beheaded. Why would you cooperate with these people? Right. But this was a man who was dedicated to science. 
his entire life, his entire career. Mm. This is the reason why I think the story may be true. Call me crazy if you want, but I think there's merit to it because of how significant of a historical figure and a right. scientific figure that this man that was. That makes sense, but I still just can't fathom like- I can't either. But look, this guy is like, he's one of the reasons we understand certain things about how oxygen works. Mm -hmm. He co-authored the modern system for naming chemical substances. Wow. And he's considered one of the founders of modern chemistry. Yeah. So if anyone was going to be able to keep their like wherewithal and their mm -hmm. like remain cognizant. He would do it for science and that would be his passion. He would do it because he believed in science. Right. Okay. That's fair. I don't know. Maybe it didn't happen. But if it did. If anyone did, it's this guy for sure. Oh, 30 blinks. I don't know about this one either, but this one I found very interesting because it's the most detailed and it's the most recent, supposedly handwritten by a Dr. Boru <laughs> in 1905, mm -hmm. barely a hundred years ago. This is about the execution of a Henry Longuille. I will now read his account that Dr. Boru wrote himself. The head fell on the severed surface of the neck, oh. and I did not, therefore, have to take it up in my hands, as all the newspapers have vied with each other in repeating. Here, then, is what I was able to note immediately after the decapitation. The eyelids and the lips of the guillotine man worked in irregularly rhythmic contractions for about five or six seconds. I waited for several seconds. The spasmodic movement ceased. The face relaxed. The lids half closed on the eyeballs, leaving only the white of the conjunctiva visible, exactly as in the dying, whom we have on occasion to see every day in the exercise of our profession, or as in those just dead. Mm -hmm. It was then that I called in a strong, sharp voice, Longi! I saw the eyelids slowly lift up, without any spasmodic contractions, but with an even movement, quite distinct and normal, such as happens in everyday life, with people awakened or torn from their thoughts. Yikes. Next, Longhi's eyes very definitely fixed themselves on mine, and the pupils focused themselves. I was not, then, dealing with the sort of vague, dull look without any expression that can be observed any day in dying people to whom one speaks. I was dealing with undeniably living eyes which were looking at me. Mm. The doctor said he called out for a second time, and again, Longhi's eyes fixed on his. Mm. And the doctor added, the eyelids lifted, and undeniably living eyes fixed themselves on mine with perhaps even more penetration than the first time. The doctor called out a third time, but by this time, Longhi was most certainly dead and did not respond. Oh my God. Dr. Boru said the whole thing had lasted 25 to 30 seconds. Wow. So again, another instance in which... 30 seconds. Roughly 30 seconds. Damn. I mean, I, I don't think it's beyond the realm of, like, believability, I guess. I don't, I don't think it is, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I also... <laughs> the thought that crossed my mind was like, okay, but what you smoking? Like, mm. what did you have to do to prepare for this? Sure. <laughs> sure. How much is that influencing your experience? And this could have been a fame obsessed person. Mm -hmm. As we know, a lot of people go into positions of authority and power because they're narcissistic, sociopathic assholes. Mm -hmm. So this guy could have seen this as a way to get famous very easily. Yeah, that's true. And it's famous. No doubt. Wow. So again, Take it however you mm. want. I can't say it's true, obviously, but I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's macabre. It's like, it's what keeps me going. <laughs> this is the fuel. Ironically. It wasn't until the 1950s and 1960s that modern medicine established the brain as the center of life. You know, there was always that question. Where's the center of life? What is mm -hmm. it? Yeah, where is it? The heart? Yeah. Yeah, they had no idea. Because the heart makes sense too, though. Yeah, it does. But they go, okay, no, it's the brain. Now we know it's the brain. That was 70 years ago. Machines can make hearts beat and lungs breathe, mm -hmm. but the brain is still a mystery for the most part. Yep. This is why it was such an incredible experience for those scientists to keep that pig brain alive that we discussed yeah. in the Phantom Cab episode. Because mm -hmm. they began to kind of understand, oh, this is how the brain works. Got it. We're figuring it out. The debate about what exactly defines life versus death is still happening today. In fact, a lot of doctors and medical professionals argue that innovations in modern medicine have actually only blurred the lines between life and death further. The device used for monitoring electrical activity in the brain is called an electroencephalogram. <laughs> 
can't say it. Encephalogram makes sense. Like encephalitis. An electroencephalogram. You know? Yep. Half of my like Latin knowledge is like diseases. So <laughs> Yeah, there you go. That's all I got for you. And this was invented in the 1920s by the German psychiatrist Hans Berger. And this has led to the eye-opening discovery that there is no such thing as a clear line between life and death. I agree. The quote-unquote declaration of death mm -hmm. wasn't standardized until the 1960s. I did know that. Yeah. And I think that's insane. That's insane to me. But it's because they, like, very few things were documented the way they are today mm -hmm. until, you know, 60s, 70s. That's why so many people can get away with so many things, you know? Yeah. Automation and documentation weren't what they are today, haven't been what they are today for very long at all. Right. And that was the collective effort of a group of people that met at, like, Harvard University. They were like, okay, we're here to determine uh, what death is. We're going to decide it here so that we can, as medical professionals, tell people that their spouse is dead. Right. <laughs> like, they're like, we have to figure this out because no one knows. I mean, yeah, people would just wait up <laughs> So they like see. They just sat down and basically just defined what death was. That was it. Yeah. Well, cool. Okay. To make our lives easier, it has to be this, it has to be this, and this. Yep. Once you meet these criteria, then... Then you're dead. Yeah. But that was just decided in a room at a college campus. Mm. So that's... Mm, that's... Mm -hmm, <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm all worked up. I can see that. Are you going to give us like buried alive statistics? No. No. Oh, God. Okay. I won't. <laughs> I'm sticking with distinctly the brain yes, okay. versus the body, if at yes. all possible, because I don't want to get too far off topic As here. You should. We're still talking about a children's story. <laughs> if you if you've forgotten, so this questionable standard has a lot to do with the brain versus the brain stem. And of course, for our purposes today, the guillotine's blade would effectively sever the brain stem, mm -hmm. cutting off the brain from the rest of the body. Yes. So they had that part right. For lack of a better explanation, bioethicists have often resorted to equating brain death to beheading, mm -hmm. telling mourning yet hopeful and confused loved ones yes. that even though the body is functioning like normal, your heart's beating, your lungs are breathing, the head may as well be removed from the body. Mm -hmm. And as we know, once it's removed, there's no putting it back on. Yeah. And yet, <laughs> there's some evidence out there to suggest that the loss of one's head doesn't necessarily mean death. Hmm. To explain myself, this is my second trigger warning. Wow. There is one really horrific experiment that occurred in 1995 Ugh. involving the decapitation of a sheep mm. on the verge of giving birth to a lamb. Oh no. They were able to keep the sheep's lungs breathing, which kept its heart pumping for roughly 30 minutes which was a sufficient amount of time to perform a cesarean section and successfully birth the lamb. Mm -hmm. They did this intentionally, knowing the sheep was going to give birth. They cut its head off oh. for science. <clears throat> and as f***ed up as that is, it did prove one thing. The body was still alive, and therefore, this is a quote, decapitated animals are not necessarily dead. Yeah. So if we human beings are just animals, as science has taught us, Mammals. then what does that mean for us? <laughs> oh God, I hate it. Is it the body that lives? Is it the brain? Or is it intangible consciousness? Mm -hmm. The sense of identity? You know, people argue, oh yeah, well, it's not my body, my brain. It's, it's me. It's my consciousness. It's myself. It's my awareness. Mm -hmm. It's who I am. Okay, but... Um, if you're suddenly rendered unconscious, right. whether by coma or fainting or falling asleep, that doesn't mean you're dead. Nope. So what is death? There have been studies showing delta brainwave activity in the brains of people whose hearts have stopped beating. Hmm. These are the brain waves associated with sleep mm -hmm. and relaxation. Low frequency. And they've been observed for up to 30 minutes after the heart stopped beating. In some cases, wow. half an hour that your brain is still going and going and making you, I guess, dream, mm -hmm. hopefully dreams and not nightmares. Uh -huh. We have no idea. I, God. All we know is you're not dead yet. Yeah. Um, I may have mentioned it to you before, but have you seen the series on Netflix called Surviving Death? I have not. You should watch that now that you've done all this research. Yeah. But they, they interview like a lot of people that have had near-death experiences and whose hearts have stopped beating who have been pronounced dead, and they talk about their experiences, what they saw, what they felt, 
and it is striking the similarity between them. Mm-hmm. Just all walks of life, all kinds of different scenarios where it happens. Yeah, I believe on that. I, I think it's that series, but there's one episode or one segment about this woman who is pregnant and she knows during her pregnancy, she tells her doctor repeatedly that she's going to die mm. giving birth. Wow. And the doctor is like, no, you're not. Yeah. But she's like certain, like she said, she knew it ever since she got pregnant that she was going to die. And she did. <laughs> hmm. um, but her whole story is fascinating because she was revived, resuscitated, I guess. Yeah, that's wild. But it touches a lot on what we as humans and humanity just can't quite understand. Yeah. There's a lot we don't know about any of this stuff. Like, the, it's just, again, there's no clear line. There's no defining factor. Mm. It's really hard to uh, <clears throat> come to terms with it sometimes. For sure. Mm. Now my... um. <laughs> spiritual bypassing brain begins to sing a hymn you ever heard the hymn farther along <laughs> maybe i don't know farther along we'll know all about it farther along we'll understand why cheer up my brother live in the sunshine we'll understand it all by and by <laughs> i don't think i know the hymn but i've definitely heard that told to me forever don't worry you'll yeah. figure it out later one day when you're dead sure yeah one day we'll know everything i hope so i mean I yeah hope that's true I'm, i'd hope that one is true as well one day when we become part of the uh, universal consciousness and we yeah and we, we get it we feed back into the energy of the universe uh-huh. and we understand everything yeah that'd be great that would be great Ooh. and i mean a lot of the people on that documentary i don't want to spoil it for people but a lot of people on that documentary describe it as bliss oh yeah good yeah of, it's just like the most blissful they've ever been and most of them have the experience that they don't want to go back mm-hmm or they don't want to leave this bliss or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it almost scares me more as you've described some of this and describing how the Delta brainwaves can continue or uh-huh. whatever. See, that's, my, that's what I'm thinking. You're not dead yet. Because it's like, so is that just what your mind does to allow you to pass? And that's not reality. That's just... It's just like midnight mass. Like you said, when your brain knows you're going to die, yeah. it unloads everything. It dumps all the chemicals that make yeah. you feel oh, euphoria. Yeah. That's why they say that your life flashes before your eyes. I think that if you come back, you haven't died. That's that's what I think. Mm -hmm. If you're able to come back and be what we understand as alive, Mm -hmm. you have not crossed over into death. Maybe. I think once you cross over, there's no coming back. Yeah. But that's just me. That's the Lazarus effect. I don't know. Watch watch the documentary and okay. see. Okay. Well, then I will watch the documentary and I will reassess. But I mean, I understand, I understand that perspective too. Like, I don't know. We're in this so deep. <laughs> Who says that you <laughs> Sorry, ever leave folks. that awareness, that Delta brainwave right, activity? Right, sure. Maybe that's where you live for Yeah, ever. that may just be how you ease off into it. Maybe there's no difference. Maybe not. I don't know. And, and again, your energy and your brain is rejoining like the collective. Again, we have no idea. We don't know what death is. <laughs> My existentialism is like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So, all that to say, getting back to our modern versions of the story, it's entirely possible that when our female character's head falls off, if this is the act that kills her, that she will always be able to remain alive long enough to utter her last words, Mm. whatever those words are, as long as they are few, before slipping into whatever it is that defines the state of existence we know as death. Hmm. So I guess in all your research, there were no instances where people made sounds or said words post beheading. There is a lot of urban legends and little ghost stories, I guess, about heads that spoke sure. after their heads were cut off yeah. and bodies that got up off of the platform and began mm-hmm. to walk around some before falling over yeah, and dying. I've heard some of those too. But I don't believe those very much yeah. because if nothing okay. else, your vocal cords would be severed. Yeah, I know. That's kind of what I thought too. There's descriptions, especially in the one that I read of the of the head, uh, his lips moving mm-hmm. as though trying to speak, okay. but no words came out. You wouldn't out. be able to. I don't think you'd be able to speak. I don't think there'd be enough. I think all of your muscle, yeah. all of your nerve, that you need to your speak. vocal cords. Yeah. Also, you can't inhale. Right. You can't breathe. Right. So I don't think there's any air You flow. have to have breath in right. order to speak as well. Now, in folklore, absolutely, yeah. headless uh, beings speak all the time. I'm just wondering if like a sound, like a moan or something, like whatever was left over. Ugh. I think the only thing left would be mouth noises. Yeah. <laughs> like, Yuck. Yeah. Mouth noises are the worst. I hate mouth noises. Chewing noises, mouth noises. The worst. Oh my God. Misophonia. Another one of the most disturbing details about the green ribbon, and the final point that we're going to make here today, is that we never find out 
what Jenny actually is, Mm. uh, how she was able to stay alive all this time, despite her head being attached by nothing more than a piece of ribbon. Yeah. Are the tubes and pipes and vessels all still attached somehow? Like, how Mm. is she able to breathe and speak like we were just talking about? Yeah. Even if it all is still ad- attached, the brainstem probably isn't. Yeah. Your nervous system is severed. Yeah. So there has to be some kind of supernatural presence. Yes. Either she isn't human or the ribbon itself is enchanted oh. by some kind of magic yes. keeping her alive. So to explore some of these possibilities, I figured that we'd have to look no further than the 14th century story commonly titled Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Aha! Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I know this one. Which, if you don't know about this story, it has a whole lot to do with beheadings and the color green. It does. To overly simplify this story... A mysterious green knight arrives at the court of King Arthur Mm -hmm. and challenges one of his knights to something known as the beheading game, Mm -hmm. which was a common motif in English folklore, mostly to do with testing the bravery and chivalry of knights. All those stories were about testing the bravery and chivalry of knights. Sir Gawain steps up to the challenge, cuts off the knight's head, but the knight, who is some kind of supernatural entity, survives the beheading promising to return the favor by cutting off Sir Gawain's head in a year's time. Mm -hmm. So, this game serves as both a temptation and as a test of the knight's moral virtue, in other words, his code of honor, by seeing if he will show up in a year's time to have his own head divorced from his body. And the idea is that he knows he's not going to survive it right? Mm -hmm. Whereas he feels like he was tricked by this green knight. Oh, yeah. Throughout the story, there are a number of hunting and seduction scenes. The seduction scenes lead to a significant item of clothing being given to Gawain, a green girdle for him to wear around his waist. This strip of green fabric was said to have magical properties Mm -hmm. that could protect the wearer from harm, even death. He accepts this strip of green fabric out of fear of the beheading, and this is symbolic of him choosing witchcraft over his trust in God to protect him, Mm -hmm. effectively cursing and dishonoring him, something often associated with sexual promiscuity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all tying together by a green ribbon. So the fact that this story takes place during two concurrent Yuletide seasons has its own level of symbolism, but for our purposes today, that merely forms the foundation for the symbolism of the color green itself. Green, both in that time and now, has always symbolized nature, fertility, and rebirth. Mm -hmm. Think of the May Day celebration involving the green man and green woman, Mm -hmm. which we found out has some of the earliest ties to Mischief Night in our Mischief Night episode. So go back and listen to it. Green has also historically been used to allude to love and the baser, more carnal desires of man. Hmm. And because of its association with fairies and spirits in English folklore, the color green is associated with witchcraft, devilry, and evil. Hmm. The Wizard of Oz? Yes. Anybody? Alphabet. We know better than any generation that green is associated with sickness, nausea, yes. death, <laughs> That's decay, what I think of. <laughs> right? Toxic sludge. Green slime? Mm. Do you think that's because people would be ill and like turn, quote unquote, unquote, turn green? green, You know, people say you turn green when you're sick. I think so. Maybe people that were poisoned. Ooh, poison. I see. I think of like sickness for me is like yellow and green. Yeah. It's just this off color. It's infection as well. It's infection. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The color green was also associated with misfortune in Celtic mythology, which is ironic considering we mostly associate green with the Celtic historical tradition. Mm -hmm. But this meant that the color green was often avoided in clothing back in that time period, especially with the Celts. Mm -hmm. So all this to say, perhaps it's all of this symbolism that led to our dear childhood friend, Alvin Schwartz, choosing green as the color for his ribbon. Mm -hmm. Because before this, it was red or black. Maybe he's hinting at something deeper. Maybe it was given to Jenny as a magical item that would keep her alive, that she should never take it off, or its magic wouldn't be able to protect her anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe it symbolized a test of her husband's trust, virtue, and moral code. Mm -hmm. But as the double-edged blade it was, it only served as a temptation and became a never-ending obsession for her poor Alfred. Mm. Perhaps it was witchcraft that kept her alive, effectively cursing her until the day came that she should be released from such a burden, such as fear, a secret, and her head released just the same. 
But perhaps most important of all is the acknowledgement of the seasons, of winter's passing and the return of the spring. And maybe we can assume that not only does the color green mean decomposition, maybe that's just the part we can see. Hmm. The other part is the regeneration of life, the rebirth of it. Mm -hmm. So this could mean that just as Jenny's story wasn't the first time her story was told, so maybe it wasn't the first time Jenny had lived it. Maybe she chose the ribbon, the necklace, the band. And now, because of this, she will forever have to wear it. Because just as our generation wasn't the first to grow up with its own iteration of the story, it's undeniably probable that we won't be the last. Mm. These are all very interesting theories. But the symbolism alone really only serves to ask more questions than it answers. We still don't know how Jenny came to lose her head in the first place. Yeah. But this one article I read suggested that perhaps due to the remaining unanswered questions, Our generation has now become the Alfred of this story. That maybe it's best we don't go asking too many questions (laughs) or tugging at too many threads. (laughs) Because maybe we'll be sorry if we do. Bum, bum, bum. Bravo. However, I do still plan to tug at as many threads as I can. (laughs) Me too. That's different. Not not the ones around people's necks. How about that? Heads will roll. (laughs) It's will roll, but not in the <laughs> literal sense. So I have some uh, some fun facts. Oh, okay. The guillotine functioned as a method of capital punishment for a long time after the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. And the last execution in France by guillotine was in 1977. Whoa. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Jeez. And the other fun fact I have, the green ribbon is the international symbol of mental health awareness. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was fitting. Yeah, I I didn't connect those dots, but Mm -hmm. wow. It's a question for you. Okay. Would you go watch a beheading by guillotine if you could? Did you go back in time? Would I like go be there? Like be there? Oh, like go back in time. I thought you meant like we have one today. No, there's there's no, there's none today. No, obviously. would Would you go watch a guillotine, the blade fall and a head roll? No. No? I don't think I could. Mm-mm. I for sure would, for a fact. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Oh, I'd go. I don't think I could do it. That's it's just it's just an interesting question. Like to be to behold anybody passing from this life to to the next. I've like, seen people die. Don't get me wrong. Who? I've been present. My uncle. You watched it? Yeah. You were in the room. I was in the room. No, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, me and my, Carrie were holding his hands when he died. That's rough. Yeah, that's wild. Obviously, not a guillotine, but still, I have seen it like take place. But it's rough. Yeah. So it. No, I don't think I want to see. I don't think I want to see heads roll. <laughs> it's it's interesting question because it's like the historical significance of it, and to like mm-hmm. understand that and like know what that felt like, know what people felt and thought around you, mm-hmm. like to actually understand what the vibe was like. Right. That's one thing, and I mean, as interesting as that is. I just don't necessarily want to see violence in, and I I mean, I don't even really care for like gore and horror movies, you know? No, me neither. It's, it's not like I'm squeamish necessarily. Like I, blood doesn't bother me. Medical stuff does not bother me. Oh, it it bothers me (laughs) for sure. Yeah. None of that bothers me, but I still don't think I'd want to see a beheading. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a fun question. (laughs) I wouldn't want to watch someone hanged. Oh no. No, I couldn't do that. And people did that constantly. That was, that was way more common. Yeah. That was historically, but no. And and more recent probably. Oh, I can't remember. But the last hanging uh, in America happened in Alabama. The last lynching. Lynching. Which isn't. That's true. Is different. You're right. That's quite different. I think that was in the eighties. That is different. Uh, That was illegal. It wasn't sanctioned. It wasn't wasn't sanctioned. Uh, Court mandated. No, no, no. That was a, that was a racial issue. It was. Yes. I don't know about the last uh, legal hanging, but. Yeah, I have no idea. Crazy that the guillotine was around in the seventies. Our parents could have have gone to watch a a beheading. Oh, yeah. My parents were like teenagers. There are a lot of accounts of uh, very prominent historical figures like Dickens, they all went to France and watched beheadings. Like they have yeah. experiences written down of what they witnessed. And, and I would have gone. For them, I can understand that because it's- I would have been one of them. You're including, sure. like you're you're narrating history, yeah. right? Like it's, mm-hmm. you're documenting it. So. It's people who were writers. It's journalism. It's journalism. Mm-hmm. Which I understand that. I would have gone for that reason, for sure. But there are certain things I definitely couldn't witness. I'm I'm not a glutton for for gore, but would you go to a uh, victims ball? Yes, that I would do. <laughs> Absolutely, See, that, that I would do. That you would do. Me too. Me too. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. That'd be crazy. Yeah, and I feel like, like you could just have one. You could just stage one. We have, I know, right? We have uh, Mardi Gras balls here in I know. you know where we live, and I just don't yep. want to don't want to go to those ever. Mm-mm. But I would go to a victims ball. No, a Mardi Gras ball. <laughs> 
No, thank it's you. Totally different. It's very like different. the people that go to not that I you know have anything against anybody, but the people that go to Mardi Gras balls are not going to balls for the reasons that I would be. Right. And I mean, there is an element of novelty to it, I guess. Yeah, I but, guess so. I don't know. Mm. Yikes! It got real dark. It gets <laughs> up really in here. dark. So you're welcome, dark. Melissa. That's why the green ribbon exists. You wanted to know what the heck? Yeah. If we that's why if we didn't mention it in this part of the. Uh, Part two. Thank you, Melissa, our listener, who yeah. reminded us of this girl with the green ribbon. Who knew there was so much to the history of the story and why it's told over and over and over? Yeah. Like we said, this is the lore behind this children's entertainment. Yeah. Things that were given to us to say like, hey, you're learning how to read. Read this story about a girl whose head falls off. Yep. And I guarantee there's plenty of people walking around at our age that have this story in the back of their mind mm-hmm. from, you know, second grade or whatever, third grade. And that's the cool thing is it's been told so many times. There are going to continue to be versions of the story told mm-hmm. from this point forward. There's there's a modern one that was written. It's a collection of short stories by a modern author. It's called Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. Machado. Do you know, I think I that I came across that in my like one search that I did. Yeah. And there's a version of this in her collection there that is from specifically from the female perspective about this sort of mm-hmm. strangely handsy, sort of weirdly yeah. abusive yep. husband. I, I, yes, yeah. I did read about this. Yeah. I and sure I'm excited did. to read it. I haven't read it yet, but I'm waiting for the book to come in to read it. But they, they talk about the husband stitch. Did you read that? The husband stitch. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yes. The husband stitch. Well, it, I'm excited about it. It's a good version. It's, it's the version that should exist for our modern times. It's the version that needed to be told this whole time from a female perspective. Yes. Whereas it's always been written by males, except for Miss McGovern's story from the 70s. But even that was just a basic folklore retelling. It wasn't. Yeah. She emphasized the masculine obsession over the female secret. Mm -hmm. And I get that. So she did sort of put her uh, impression on it, her imprint on it. And that's good. But I think that, again, that's one of the versions that opened the door for modern versions to sort of shine through. I, yeah, that's totally kind true. Kind of expose the symbolism behind this guy who thinks he owns this woman. Yep. You know? In in this, um, the husband stitch, the modern retelling that, that you just mentioned, mm-hmm. um, the article I read said that she explores the notion that a woman's body isn't for herself and that even in one of the most intimate human experiences, her body belongs not to her but to her partner mm-hmm. as his desire outweighs her own biology. Yep. And yep. that is – I mean, it's it's just like you were you mentioned in the previous episode or the previous um, part, the idea of assault or taking something mm-hmm. that's not yours but making it yours and it's just – Unreal. But I think that that symbolism is absolutely tied in yeah. the core of the story. I think it was always there, which is amazing. Cause like the fact that it wasn't just people from the from this French Revolution era, it wasn't just like men and women walking around who were losing their heads. It was always a woman. Right. And I wonder why. I mean, is it just because males were writers in those days and women didn't have a voice? Yeah. Did men just obsess over the idea of like females not having their heads attached maybe <laughs> women's uh you know screw was loose or something was that well, just their it, interpretation maybe they just took like they their sensibilities were a little more like forgiving to a woman perhaps whereas if men were bad and maybe they deserved it or the violence was justified but even in those days maybe there were some men subconsciously that just didn't appreciate that being put on a woman perhaps although perhaps. that's still misogynistic as hell but <laughs> it could it could also be that like as a fashion statement at the time women wore the red accent. Yeah, maybe. I don't think men did. So maybe just in that time, it was just more common to see women right. wearing chokers. So that's why that was what was in the lore, the story. That could be why it evolved into seeing ghost women around, you know, France or Paris just wearing these bands because it was so common. It was almost like you could see a woman wearing a choker at night mm-hmm. walking down the street and you could assume, you know, passingly that maybe she wasn't. Human. Ugh. Maybe she was a ghost. Wow. So maybe that's just where it came from. I mean, it all makes sense to me, but I wish there was like – I like that there's not a, like a, an obvious um, origin. Yeah, because it just it, – it's just that collective – Yeah, it's a bunch of different people sitting around drinking, talking about ghost stories. That mm-hmm. It came from something. Crazy. Well, thank you for uh, taking us on this 
very bloody journey. <laughs> I'm sorry it was so bloody. I'm sorry it was so much. Wow, what a time. Like I said, Melissa, you did this to yourself. <laughs> this was your doing. Sorry, Melissa. But thank you for uh, reminding us about this. Yes, because we very much appreciate your message, and we hope you know yeah. that we can do more of this with the stories that you guys you know that stick in your memory mm -hmm. too as much as the ones that we remember exactly uh so we hope this got you in the christmas spirit <laughs> <laughs> thanks oh. for listening we hope you have beautiful beautiful happy holidays whatever you celebrate this time of year indeed hopefully you're celebrating and if not and you kind of get depressed around the holidays like we do hey you're not alone you're not alone and we are right here with you reach out to us and let us know because we're probably we'll feeling the same thing. absolutely that's why I resort to ghost stories around this time of year, because mm -hmm. historically, that's the only thing that makes sense to me about this time of year. <laughs> the, the Yuletide season, that's all I got. It's just the tradition of death and ghost stories. <laughs> that's it. That is it. And wine. Oh, and whiskey. Those always make sense. Always. Yeah, but on that note. It's almost Christmas, so we will be back to see you then. We'll see you then with some spooky stories about Ooh. little animatronic fuzzy little robots that come to life that's a tease but we're excited to debut a very interesting wtf christmas episode so don't miss it yeah guys we'll see you then thanks for listening go drink your french wine and uh you know don't lose your head please please don't lose your head bye guys bye thanks for listening to that's pretty dark written and produced by christian baxter mott and kaylin andrews our music is composed by Jonathan Simmons, and our art is provided by Paige Garland at Power Girl Illustration. Join the collective nostalgia and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at That's Pretty Dark Podcast. Share your experiences and let us know what shows, films, or villains still haunt you from childhood at That's Pretty Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, you're never really alone. So until next time, sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>